Well, I know I'm under pressure now because I'm keeping you guys between uh, happy hour and, uh, and such, so we'll uh, move right along. So I'm going to talk to you about operating from Lake Superior this year. This was uh, quite a fun exercise this year. And I'm going to talk to you about the history of Lake Superior microwave operations. It's been going on for quite a long time. Talk about the contest operating philosophy, which is probably not that unique, but uh, we'll tell you what, what the plan was. And we'll talk a little bit about the weather and band conditions from the uh, four main locations or areas. And uh, first of all, Lake Superior, as uh, I'm sure you all are aware of it on the map, but did you realize it's almost 350 miles wide, 160 miles high, and has a shoreline of almost 2,800 miles? When you're roving around the perimeter of Superior, you can drive a long way, so. And of course, it's got some uh, great scenery, and it is the largest freshwater lake in the world by surface area. So for the history of uh, microwave operations, you know, I'm a flatlander, right? So, and, and no, you know, not many trees. So operating from Superior is a real treat for landlocked stations. You know, you've got clear shots with few obstacles, some really long paths with maybe the promise of some enhanced propagation. So it's quite an attractive location to operate from. The first operations done by the Northern Lights Radio Society out of the Minneapolis, St. Paul area primarily was done in 2001, 2002. And it was a short one-day visit with uh, good results using wideband FM and some early sideband CW systems, which of course back then were low power and pretty drifty and things like that. But uh, I guess uh, a lot of fun anyway. So the question that came up from the group was, well, what if we made a major effort to, instead of just a one-day jaunt? So in 2003, there was then 18 stations that went around the lake and there was some experimentation with high and low altitude uh, locations, like you saw the picture earlier of the lighthouse station, it's a long ways above the water. You can't always get down to the water either, but uh, so there's some experimentation uh, there just to see what worked and what didn't. 2004, there was another major effort that actually included an expedition to the, to the Canadian side at Wawa, and there was a repeat of the high and low uh, contest experiments uh, with some of the UHF bands involved. I think uh, they were probably playing around with uh, trying to use two meters for liaison. And of course, you know what uh, 10 gigs is like. You can easily out talk uh, two meter coverage. No contacts were made across the wide part of the lake. So uh, Wawa didn't do very well. Uh, this is the area that, uh, you know, the primary focus uh, for some groups up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and then that group that would work their way along between sites on the Upper Shore, the North Shore of Superior. There's quite a few spots here, uh, as you can see, to work back, so it, uh, really a, a good location. So a bigger effort was done in, in 2012 with significant improvements in, in equipment, of course, you know, we had better frequency accuracy, you know, the old uh, down east microwave, uh, I remember the, uh, the, the term for the crystal-based reference oscillators that used to drift like crazy. micro -LO. micro LO, that's it, yeah. So, I mean, we had better accuracy, better stability. We had a little more experience with uh, pointing uh, across the lake and, uh, you know, being fairly accurate in, in our pointing. More experience with the propagation on the lake and, of course, stations were now running higher power, so. <coughs> And we had more stations deployed uh, around the lake. So this was the uh, layout of stations at that time. So you can see we still had the big group on the North Shore. We had a couple down here on the, on the South Shore. Still a group over in the Upper Peninsula. And we had a group uh, t two locations over here uh, in uh, Ontario. And we also had uh, a U.S. group over in, uh, f in the far uh, eastern Ontario, in the, uh, so there was quite a, quite a good group there. A lot of uh, diversity across the lake. So um, if you remember on the North Shore, uh, we had all those spots that you could visit. So there was a very large group. So this year, 
for 2018, we had 14 stations on that north shore. And there were stops about every 10 miles. Now, you know, 14, 14 stations is problematic, so they actually broke it into two smaller groups. Uh, but uh, there was also uh, uh, two groups that were operating from uh, the upper peninsula of Michigan. And there's actually, uh, let's see, where are we here? So anyway, the North Shore group uh, goes north on the first day. You know, there's a lot of sites to visit. And then they would work their way back on the next day. But the Upper Peninsula people have moved in the meantime. In the meantime so you've got a whole new set of contacts. So, so the North Shore group also had to split into two groups just to facilitate the setups. Because if you've got 14 stations, then you'll see in some of the pictures coming up, there isn't room for 14 people to set up. So they broke into two groups, and it also provided a smoother flow of contacts with the guys in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. You could have one group come in, work the Upper Peninsula guys, then they would move on. The next group was moving in and keeping the Upper Peninsula guys busy. Well, the next guys were moving 10 miles, and then so it was a more, a more continuous flow of contacts. And we had a small group of stations at uh, Marathon, Ontario. And we did have 10, 24, 47, and 78 gigahertz there. And the, uh, the original plan was to actually do some ser real serious operations on 47 and 78. I talked uh, first thing in the conference about the, the high performance rigs that I had. And unfortunately, the two stations that were going to meet me on the other side uh, didn't make it. So we didn't do much on the higher bands. And there was a small group of three stations at Grand Marais, Michigan. So this is, uh, this is the layout of uh, the stations in this year. So we, again, we had the big group going along the North Shore and uh, uh, two groups that were split between three sites. You know, unfortunately, some of these sites uh, are problematic because they don't, they can't always, they can't view all locations. There's actually only one location here that can, could view uh, us up north. And uh, these guys only, uh, I don't think they could see uh, the Upper Peninsula, they could only see us. So yeah, there were, yeah, there's some, some limitations there. Don? Yeah, I, I, I mentioned it later here, so. Oh, you could see Grand Marais. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right, so I'm glad they had something more than us anyway, but uh, I wasn't sure with the shuffling between the three sites, what the, who they could work and who they couldn't, so. Okay, so this is what we could see from Marathon, and it was pretty limited. You know, the North Shore, there was only a few sites where the guys could actually shoot towards us. And then, of course, uh, Mount Brockway here, uh, the shortest path for us, 179 kilometers, uh, you know, it was uh, a good, good path anyway. And then this was the path down to Grand Marais, so limited, but, you know, it's just part of the equation. It gave some longer shots anyway. You did complete all the way from Duluth. Oh, okay, I must have missed that one. I think I, I do catch it in the summary. Yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty weak CW, I think, yeah, it was, yeah. I was busy setting up yet, and I had two, two stations to set up, uh, a QRP station and a big one, and I think uh, while it was going on, then it was over, you guys had moved, so. It's, uh, anyway. So Saturday morning, we had no wind and 10 gig signals were S9 for Mount Brockway. That was the 179 kilometer hop, but there was absolutely no 24 gig signals. But the Mount Brockway crew had local fog and presumably there was fog out in the middle too. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't know if anyone looked at the weather stations to see, to confirm that that was the case, but I think that there was some uh, weather information later. The Grand Marais group was worked on 10 gigs. Nothing was heard on 47, but that group only had horns, like uh, Paul Wade's horns on 47. 
and we didn't even bother to try 24. This was in the morning. Late in the afternoon, 24 gigs appeared from Mount Brockway over the 179 kilometer path as the fog had disappeared at their end and presumably in the middle as well. So. And then one hour later, the North Shore group uh, was good on 10, but we didn't try 24. I'm not sure why. Just uh, in the busyness, it just didn't happen. One hour later again, 24 uh, gig signals were good from the upper peninsula. Uh, you know, again, 179 kilometer path, so. It was all pretty much uh, sideband, except for that real early one. I'll, when I'll, you'll see in the summary. But yeah, signals were all good. On Sunday, we had strong winds. Seems we had wind, winds at times, and the strong winds, it, it really had rapid QSB, so very fluttery signals. Good 10 gig signals, regardless, from several of the North Shore grids. Again, there was limited visibility from those sites, so we didn't have too many sites to play with. And then we worked the second group on the Upper Peninsula when they had shifted over that originally didn't have visibility of us on Saturday, so we, we worked them on Sunday. Okay, so this was a kind of a summary of the grids that we worked. This is the one that you were talking about, the 489 kilometer shot early in the morning, weak CW, but I think pretty much all of this was, uh, was uh, SSB. You can see the uh, the bolded 24 gig contacts here late in the afternoon and the early evening and nothing in the morning. And then Sunday, you know, some decent, uh, decent signals again with 10 gigs. This is the crew that we had in, uh, in Marathon, so K0KFC, uh, V380Q, who's here with me, and K0AWU and V3KRP. And that's just a, uh, that's the broader picture of our setup that we had there. And uh, this was the setup I had with the four bands that I didn't get to use. Even had a solar panel, and uh, had, uh, which worked out okay. Had some problems with the system, but hey, first time out in the field. So on the North Shore, uh, as it turns out, if you looked at the Hepburn map but for 2,100 hours on Saturday, it showed good enhancement, uh, which you know seemed to correlate with what we were seeing with uh, they were seeing with working us in uh, V3 land and the Upper Peninsula. And what the North Shore experienced from the last stop on Saturday from Grand Portage, which was the northern end of their run. On Sunday, the Hepburn maps really didn't show the great propagation. I don't know, does, how many guys use the Hepburn maps to look at, look and anticipate? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know what, what uh, most people think. Sometimes it, it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, those computers that they use for doing that are used to predict our weather in Canada. And yes, <laughs> it's it's Canadian Weather Office computers, yeah. And uh, I I think they they may use a different model than the U.S. or there's what a European model as well. So I mean, who knows what they're doing? But yeah, sometimes it works. At this time of the year, uh, you know, it's I think it's pretty easy to predict tropo, but. Uh, Anyway, uh, Sunday the, the Hepburn maps didn't show it. This is what the Hepburn maps looked like for the Saturday. You can see there's Lake Superior. So, you know, we did have some enhancement in there and probably some fog, right? The stuff that prevented the 24. And you can see there was uh, quite a bit of other stuff going on. Looks like uh, some other lake stuff down here pretty good. Yeah, Lake Michigan, I don't know if anyone was there. No. Missed it, darn. Yeah. So the North Shore crew uh, saw a huge swing in signal strength between uh, locations. This is high and low elevations at the end of the day on Sunday. And uh, there was definitely some low level ducting. So if you, were, if you were low, low, the signals were great. If you were low, high, they were still okay, but not as good, obviously, so.
And uh, correspondingly, uh, Glenn KC0YYT, and I'll show you a picture of him a little later, worked the, uh, the guys in the Upper Peninsula from Flood Bay with 200 milliwatts and a 7 dB horn with 5.9 plus sideband signals. So definitely some good conditions there. Uh, when we were there in 2014, I think I had a, a QSO across to uh, Brockway at 179 kilometers, and I had uh, 12 milliwatts and a gun flexor horn on a Demi transverter sideband. And, and it wasn't, you know, a great signal for me, I'm sure, but it worked, so. Is that right? So, you know, Superior can really dish it out. So anyway, this is, uh, this is what the North Shore Group worked from the nine stops. And you can see that 489 kilometer long haul hop there. But otherwise it's all sideband stuff, bang, bang, bang. And not real long shots, but you know, well there's a good one, 365, that's all right. And then uh, towards the end of the day, they got into the 24 gig stuff. So, and so here it is. There was no 24 gigs, and they were low down down by the water. And then later, they were up high. No, was that? Uh, the signals were never used. On the well, I completed from. Th those weren't my words. They were ZQs. So. Uh, <laughs> okay. No. Uh, Oh, okay. Uh, the other thing was 10 gig last night on Sunday were very poor. Yeah. Most sites were amazingly well. Yeah, well, that's what this says. You know, they were high on the last stop, so. It was off. Yeah. I have a good estimate. We had about 7 dB of a chance. Okay, so anyway, uh, yeah, just more of the stuff. That uh, 24 gig contact, of course, that, that's not very far, so that should have been a duck, duck soup shot. Uh, there's a good one, 394 kilometers. But S2, SSB, yeah, overland, so it's not really a late contact, but it was uh, from the group anyway. That, that, yeah. Location, anyway. Yeah, right. Yeah, we I'll move right along with these things since uh, happy hour is coming. So anyway, uh, right at the end here, the 24 gigs uh, with such big signals on 10, 24 was weak CW. Yeah. Oh, was that right? Okay. Yeah. The buoy two points the best are for upper yeah, you look at the path loss and that's huge for 24. Okay, and then again, 24 kind of got wiped out towards the end there. And then right at the end there, uh, you know, it's, it, everything is weak, so there, it's out of the duct. 
Okay, this is the, a picture of the North Shore group uh, when they were starting out around Duluth. So you can see there was quite a few guys there. Probably didn't catch them all in the picture, but it's there. And then here's one of the, uh, one of the groups in the fog. So you can see they're well above the water. And you can also see why it would be hard to get 14 vehicles in here with guys uh, set up. <laughs> and here's Glenn Casey Zero IYT with his QRP uh, QSO with his little horn and yeah is that right yeah wow Okay, so there was two groups operating from three locations in the Upper Peninsula. And Don, you can pipe up when appropriate. And they were kept busy with QSOs from uh, the two North Shore groups and then also the Marathon group. The three Upper Peninsula locations did not have complete visibility of all sites, so that they had to move. And that, that's why, uh, you know, we worked the second group on Sunday that we had no visibility of on Saturday, so from Marathon. The Mount Brockway height, uh, site was very high above the water, 726 feet, and the only one with the visibility of Marathon. So, so here's some pictures of the setup on the uh, the Upper Peninsula. I don't know. If, uh, probably don't need to explain this. It's self self evident, I think. There's Don with his setup. So out of Grand Beret, Michigan, there was the smallest group, and uh, and well, some I, somehow I thought only Marathon was visible to them, but anyway, distance of 224 kilometers. Their operation was limited to Saturday only, since they had you know limited opportunity to work people, and unfortunately, propagation didn't support 24 and 47 to them, but they had a good 10, 10 gig signal, so. And their op operation is well documented. I don't know if you, any of you have seen the YouTube video. I think I referred to it in the paper, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a nice video. But here's what their setup looked like. So they were really camped on the beach. Yeah, an old Prime Star dish, so... So Lake Superior outtakes. So the marathon group had countless interruptions, and I'm sure you've all had this from locals wanting to know what we were doing. <laughs> and I was on the end of the lineup, and I, most often I was getting interrupted. And uh, you know, if I, you know, that may have resulted in some of the missed QSO opportunities because it was kind of like, well, okay, I gotta go, sort of thing, you know. Because <laughs> uh, the North Shore group, they weren't sticking around for very long. It was bang, bang, and. I think I missed a bunch of them, but I caught them the neck on Sunday. They, I uh, protested loudly that they didn't uh, didn't work me, and they they made it a point of making up for it on Sunday. So, <laughs> just wait, just wait. Then anyway, I have a feeling that we did a great job for PR for the hobby in in Ontario. Anyway. We even got visited by the local historian who was going to do a write-up in the local paper. He took a bunch of shots and stuff like that. And there was just so many people coming by because it was kind of a park area, you know, and we were parked in the parking area of the park. So, like, they'd come around and, whoa, you know, small town, what, what are you guys doing, you know? And <laughs> you're, you're, watch, you're watching TV for Michigan? What? What? <laughs> So this is this is some of the group groups that uh, that we had for visitors here, and this is uh, you know there's several groups in here at the time, so we got them to pose for a picture anyway. So so the Upper Peninsula group had an unexpected interruption from a wedding party taking photos, <laughs> and the big question is, ah, did the ham activities actually stop when this was going on? 
So, I mean, they're right there out, you know, they're right out front, right? So. <laughs> was that your group, Don? No. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, accomplishments and accolades. Well, I think we saw some pretty interesting propagation again with some, you know, pretty long-haul QSOs. It could have been more, I guess, if uh, we'd all been set up when things got rolling and things like that, and we tried a few more things, and some of the high-power 47 and 78 guys that had made it. But uh, there's always a next time. Hopefully it won't take so long to come back, but... Uh, and yeah, unfortunately, like I said, there was no exchanges on 47 and 78, which is, uh, well, other than a local one. And uh, I had a, another station there for 24 and, uh, and 78, so. So anyway, a large part of the success of this weekend was due to uh, a great amount of early coordination and correspondence uh, with all the Northern Lights groups coordinated by Gary, WB0LJC. And then, of course, there was the on-site activities of the group leaders. Uh, you know, we had all those groups roaming around, and you've got to control the chaos somehow. So, I mean, those guys did a great job. So, so with that, are there uh, any uh, questions that you guys might have? <laughs> you need strong leadership, Paul. <laughs> so how did the liaison work? Was it mostly on two meters and what was the protocol for cell people phones. jumping in? Oh, cell phones. Actually, between the North Shore and the UP, we almost never needed to pay Yeah. We knew we were moving a certain distance. We could tell them move your antenna to the to the right or to the left. When we got to our new site, we took them then, they were us. Yeah. We, did, we rarely even need to come to set up two rough square to point, typically five band signal to us. Yeah, we, we had the same thing in the North Shore. The angle changed so little, you you know, you, and beam widths are, you know, reasonably wide, so. Yeah, we, just once you, once you had the first contact, you knew they were coming, so. Did you ever try FM on uh, 10 gig? Uh, no, not that weekend. I, I did have one FM contact the, uh, the following uh, weekend, but no, the signals were too, too good on sideband. Uh, there was when you were uh, trying 24 gig, Barry, did you guys um, ever try elevation? Over here. Over here. Yeah. Did, did you guys ever try elevation when you were doing 24 gig? I don't um, think so. Yeah, not, not we've seen did. that before. Don, you did? Yeah, we've seen that before, where we can be at the horizon and absolutely nothing and come up two or three degrees. And really? Bang. Yeah. Wow. Just curious. Also down. We, we've gone what did both you see, Don? Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I made any effort. I mean, this, the signal. Oh, was that right? I thought you had more than that. From the North Shore, I tried all of these. Not at every stop on 24. I had a dual band. Did did you do any narrow uh, wideband? Okay. A wideband what? Uh, FM? Yeah. No. Uh, Does anyone one. still have those rigs? Oh yeah, we we yeah, yeah, yeah. no. <laughs> We we come a long way. Uh, Barry, has the um, Hepburn uh, address changed? 
uh, I mean, know there was a problem. I don't know if it's been changed or not. I haven't looked at it. Uh, I tried clicking it on and just, I can never connect. So that's why I was wondering. Yeah, I know there's, is it back? Oh, good. Oh, okay. Anything else? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank and, you very uh, much, Barry.